Today, I'm having lunch with the CEO of a hedge fund that has grown their assets under management over a thousand times, from under 3 million to over 3 billion US dollars. Members of the firm are known to be highly elusive, rarely making media appearances, but are most known for safeguarding a strategy that has remained a black box since 2006. I've traded global financial markets and advised some of Asia's wealthiest for more than 20 years. Yet, I'm constantly in search of new perspectives on finance, business and of course life. So I booked tables and put wine on my tab just to bring you some food for thought. Towering above the shopping strip of Singapore is a Nikkei restaurant perfect for lunch with the CEO of a high-flying hedge fund. Hey, hi. hey Sharon. Hi, how, how are you? you? Good to see you. Good to see you. The Peruvian Japanese fusion they serve here is a riot on the palate, delivering both freshness and intense flavours in a single bite. I'm hoping it will spark a spicy conversation. Welcome to One Ethico. So here I do have the Unito Morokoshi, which is the great white corn topped with some sea urchin and of course some showers of the Japanese spices. Please do enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. As an investor, as a wealth manager, I've been following Quantage from very early days, right? Actually, as early as 2006. Wow, okay. Um, and that's Surprised you'd heard of us from then. Yes, yes. Okay. I think in general, right, there's a lot of misconception maybe about hedge funds um, mm. out there. I agree. Right, firstly, people are not sure about what's, what, what you guys are doing. Is it a black box investing? Is it high risk trading? What, what kind of strategy you're running? How would you explain uh, what Quantage really does? Right? Mm. I wouldn't say it's a misconception so much as it is an overgeneralization. Right? Because there's a spectrum. There are funds that engage in high frequency trading and do a lot of trading every day, and there are funds that hold their positions for years. We certainly look at ourselves as long-term investors. So we're in markets generally holding for long periods of time. We're quant analysts. We just look at price action and numbers to tell us how much we should invest, where we should invest, in order to create that more efficient investment portfolio. Now, of course, that changes from day to day, right? Today, the market's telling you one thing, tomorrow it'll tell you something else. So from day to day, we are always um, adjusting our positions. Portfolio sort of evolves. So it is quite a complex operation uh, in our firm where we trade every day across not just 250 different markets, but you know, thousands of different instruments and securities. With over 70 staff and more than 600 clients, today's Quantage is a far cry from the early days where the two founders traded their own money out of their bedroom. Their track record of outsized returns has repeatedly landed the firm at the top of rank tables of Bloomberg, Barron's, Asia Hedge, among others. What I find most amazing is the firm uses only one strategy and it's been the same since day one. So, what is uh, unique about you know, your quant investing strategy? Is it very momentum driven? You're looking for price signals, you're looking for directional changes? Well, momentum is one of the things that goes into it. I would say we, we do describe ourselves as global macro. And that generally means that we conduct our investment analysis on a top-down basis. Right? We look at macro data rather than you know, fundamental sort of company-level data or issuer-level data. And that's how we've generally started but the portfolio has evolved so much, so we're adding more and more things into the strategy, including uh, equity long-short strategies, where we are you know, investing based on factors like, as you say, momentum, value, dividends, all sorts. So I would say we've, we've evolved beyond being a traditional macro fund. Obviously, we are very numbers-driven. What can you actually read from those numbers? What can you actually predict? Uh, I don't think we can predict what's going to happen tomorrow or next week. You can't? Uh, we can't, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. We don't have the crystal ball. Many people sort of misunderstand and think quantitative investing can give you that precision in terms of you know, forecasting the future. Uh, I don't think that's true. But I think what we can say is if we study the history of uh, financial markets and how things have behaved in the past, at least we know the range of you know, possible outcomes and assign probabilities to them. 
And that gives you an idea of what you should expect and also keep you alert as to what are the possible downside risks. What do you think with all the technology, the experience and, and the knowledge we've gathered over the years, why can't we predict financial markets? Well, think about it this way. Um, if, say, you have a game of chess, right, the rules are defined, uh, each piece can only move a certain way, there's a fixed number of possibilities. right? So you can plan your strategy based on you know, how many hundred moves there are. In the financial markets, it's quite different because there's an unlimited number of factors that can affect how each individual investor decides to invest. And there's so many market players who you cannot possibly predict how they're going to think. You know, that's the beauty of the market in some sense, the fact that it cannot be predicted. And that's why we're being rewarded for participating. For us, that idea of risk premium is really important because we believe markets exist for the purpose of risk transfer. When you look at, let's say, the stock markets or equity markets, there is a risk transfer that's happening between the companies and investors who are providing the capital. And usually when a risk transfer happens, the risk takers get rewarded for that risk, which is what we believe in, the risk premium. The Quantage chase for risk premium has netted investors annualised returns of 21% since the inception of the fund, setting the firm apart in the hedge fund industry. But the returns are by no means consistent. High reward is usually born of high risk. Look at your fund stats so far. There were years where you are down, years that you're up a lot as well. Your volatility is also very high, right? It's like 30% average volatility over the last 15 years. There so it's not, it's not a number that most people can stomach, correct? So how do you manage risk in that sense? Mm -hmm. Well, philosophically, we, we think about uh, risk as a choice parameter in the sense that we we can choose what level of risk we want to take in the markets. So we target a constant level of risk at a portfolio level and it's a choice that we make to say we want to target say around 30% annualized volatility. Put that into context, right? that means maybe twice the amount of risk in a normal market environment. But when you have a portfolio that applies a constant risk control, what it means is when markets are going haywire, which happened, let's say, March 2020 or 2008, volatility spikes, you know, market risk goes up. In order for us to maintain that constant risk, we have to reduce our exposures. On the flip side, when things calm down, when there's nothing happening in the markets, that's when we take more risk. We increase our exposures and positions. So the way to think about it is, you know, you should make hay when the sun shines, right? And when it's stormy, you know, you need to take cover. So that's generally what we do. We're not trying to be clever and saying, I can tell you where the markets are going tomorrow. Uh, we're not taking, you know, huge bets on single tech stocks. We believe that all that information that's out there is actually priced in the markets, which is why we prefer to react to what the market says, rather than to try and, you know, predict how the market will move. Mm. Because Actually, when you think about it, that's a very risky thing to do. Right? You could be very, very wrong. Uh, you could be completely you know, ill-positioned. Hi, sir, ma'am. Here we do have the yellowtail ceviche. Most of the flavours actually come from the leche de tigre, which is also the tiger's milk from Peru. Please do enjoy. Great, thank you. It's amazing how you can stay that rational, right? Especially when the markets were panicking and no one could see the end in sight for the pandemic. Is there anything that investors or, or I can learn? A lot of what we do at the portfolio, you know, in terms of the investment strategy, that applies as well to the way that we run the business. Right? We, we try to make sure that we have you know, the right information. We try to look at possibilities and try to assess the probabilities. We're also, I would say, courageous and patient at the same time. So we're not afraid to do things which are slightly different from the market because we think that uh, it pays you know, to be courageous. We're in it for the really long term. Uh, we want to run this portfolio for... Forever? Uh, hopefully. Uh, well, certainly we're, we're thinking in terms of decades. Okay. Right? We're thinking beyond our lifetimes, what's going to happen uh, to this portfolio, which has most of our own net worth. Uh, and obviously the net worth of many of our investors, 
how can we run a portfolio that's going to last you know, beyond their lifetimes, that can benefit their children and the next generations. That requires a lot of patience, we're not in a rush. And you need to be very sort of deliberate in what you do. It's time for our mains, so Chef has invited us to the dining hall for the royal treatment. He's dishing out his signatures of ultra-premium A4 Wagyu beef and black miso cod, both tenderly grilled over the slow burn of Japanese oak charcoal. Hi sir, ma'am. Hope you're actually looking forward for the main course. This would be your Wagyu A4 sirloin, served together with the black garlic karashi. Here I do have the gindara miso yaki, accompanied with the ahi verde sauce, which is also the Peruvian green sauce. Are the flowers edible? Yes, it is edible, ma'am. Please do enjoy. Thank, Thank you. you. Hmm, looks good. The firm has grown tremendously and you have almost 70 uh, employees across That's Singapore correct. and also New York. Mm -hmm. That's a fairly decent-sized team, right? How much of your strategy is actually driven by machine and how does the human element come into play? That's a good question because I think most people, when they think about quantitative fund managers, uh, they think about machines doing most of the work. To a certain extent, that's true in the sense that we are reliant upon models and algorithms to do some of the heavy lifting. We can run the portfolio of 200 over different markets, thousands of positions, because we are augmented by machines. But a core part of what we do is still based on human input. Reading through uh, research materials and figuring out whether there is a risk premium and deciding whether or not it's good enough for a portfolio, that's a human decision. During my research into Quantage, an interesting fact I came across is that since they started, only three employees have left the firm and none have left for a competitor. The culture from day one has always been one of collegiality. I think the founders themselves epitomised that. And they worked together very closely uh, and did everything together, came to joint decisions. And that tone at the top affects everyone below. It's interesting because I, I came from a banking background, right? So even within uh, equities division, there will be researchers, there will be salespeople, and there will be traders, right? Traders may think that they are making the shots because they're making the big trades and then bringing in a big money, right? Mm. And after some time, there will be a bit more competition within the group. What is the uh, culture that's so special, you know, and how do you inculcate that? I think the quant investing methodology lends itself well to a collaborative approach. In many ways, uh, encourages more teamwork. Right? So unlike, what do you mean? Yeah. unlike a situation where you've got superstar traders, you know, portfolio managers who try to outdo others, in a quant approach, you need many contributors looking at many different markets, performing all kinds of research. The more people you have, you're going to create a more robust model. The world is so huge. How do you look at the opportunity? What, what shouts out to you as this is opportunity? Well, I suppose we don't look at opportunities in, in the same way as many other discretionary managers, right? Every single financial market out there is an opportunity. And what we want to do is look at all these markets, especially the bigger markets. Try and understand the market microstructure. You know, who are the players? Why are they behaving in a certain way? Why are there biases in the market? And if we can identify those biases, and we think that those biases will subsist for the long term, then that's a great opportunity for us to trade, right? We just then need to determine uh, how do we access the market? Can we do it in a cost-efficient manner? Uh, and then we code it into the whole model. In the earlier days, we used to access the bigger markets, uh, the more accessible markets, you know, the equity futures, bond futures. And today we're into so many different markets, it's, it's of course getting harder and harder to find new ones. Um, but there are still markets that are untapped. Like, for example, in the last three years, we've, we've gone into uh, US mortgage-backed securities, close-ended funds, and we've gone into some 
China-based commodities. So there are pockets here and there that so it's coming more and more uh, niche. Absolutely. And, yeah, I myself have been an investor in you know in Bitcoin since two thousand and seventeen. Right? Wow. Okay. We've been hearing institutions getting quite interested, involved in uh, crypto investing as well. How do you see crypto fitting into Quan H's um, strategy? I mean, is there room for it? It's interesting because when you compare Quantage to, I guess, traditional investing, people think we're probably a bit ris uh, risky there. Um, but when you compare us to cryptocurrencies, we're probably pretty conservative. As we assess whether or not this is suitable for our portfolio, we need good data to support it. So at the moment, we would say we can't identify the risk premium yet, not on a conclusive basis. And maybe it's a question of time because it's still a very young, very nascent market. There are operational challenges, different risks in terms of accessibility, of custody, and there's that huge element of regulatory risk. The monetary system has, as far as you know, we can remember, been controlled. And for that to become decentralized, I think there's going to be huge amounts of resistance. There's going to be a lot done to prevent that from happening because obviously control of currency and money gives you a lot of influence and control over the economy. So there's good reason for governments to want to keep that under close watch. So things can change a lot and that's, that's the kind of risk that is very difficult to quantify. So I would say you know, we're, we're watching, we're, we're researching, but it's something that could happen in the future. Looking out 15 years, right, as you gather more data, your model and your business grows, does it require less human uh, contribution? And would the future be one where there is more machine, right, than man in the way you operate? I think over time, invariably, there will be more technology being used. Uh, and that's just not just in sort of research and portfolio construction, but many aspects of the business. The operation side, risk management side, even the investor relations side of things. But in each case, we're not thinking about whether we can replace human beings with machines. We're talking about how do we make the human being's job easier, being more accurate, working faster, being able to do more. What that does is that it frees up our time, our mental capacities, it allows us to be more creative. We can think about new asset classes, new ways of trading. I think that creative thinking will remain something that humans are uniquely good at. Hi sir, ma'am. I do have the desserts to end your beautiful lunch for today. So here I do have the shisho ice cream and also the santarin parfait with nori rice puff. I'll take the uh, ice cream, shisho ice, ice cream. And uh, I believe, sir, yours would be the Santorin Parfait. Please okay. do enjoy. Thank you. In 2016, Quantish Capital decided to apply the investing philosophy to philanthropy by establishing Quantage Foundation. You guys have a very big uh, vision. You want to do good better. Maybe you can share with us what do you mean by that. You know, it's, it's kind of like just, just like investing, right? If you're going to invest, you know, we should be thinking about how you can do it better. And that's in many ways what quantitative investing is, right? Trying to figure out how to do it more efficiently, uh, produce better returns. And I think the same concept applies when you're giving, right? Because resources are limited and you've only got one life to do it, right? So why not? every step of the way, sort of try and think about where that next dollar can go to, you know, how much more impact can you achieve through your donation, and measure that impact over time. How do you internally measure the outcome of it? The reality is not everything is measured well within the social service space. Uh, so there are many projects that are done where you know, it, it, the outcomes are there for people to see, uh, but the numbers are not tracked very well. So when we go into a project, we try to scope out the numbers that we want to see, that we expect to see. So depending on the program, we track different things. School attendance, literacy, numeracy, 
different sort of milestones in the development of a child. The foundation has dispersed over 5 million US dollars in support of causes in education, community development, poverty relief and health. They are committed to helping youth and communities maximize their potential by enabling access to opportunity. Where do you think are the gaps where you can make the most difference? As you said, right, making your dollar work smarter mm -hmm. in terms of doing good. There are many, many causes that we can support, but we have chosen to focus on social mobility. So we think that social mobility is probably one of the biggest issues of our time, primarily because without social mobility, we will create a permanent sort of underclass. People who always struggle and, and can never sort of break out of that disadvantaged status or situation. I think it's a big issue in Singapore because of the stage of our development. We're a pretty young country, 50 plus years post-independence, and the previous generation benefited from great amounts of social mobility. If you work hard, you have the opportunity and you will, you will be able to change your status in life. And that's starting to change in quite a big way. We're starting to see structures crystallize, which make it difficult for anyone who's born in a disadvantaged circumstance from fighting his way out of it. Uh, and that's something we've got to guard against, right? Because if it stays that way for too long, then you can't change the system. So I think we need to fight, fight it now. You need to provide opportunities for people in those situations because it helps society as a whole. We wanted a charity of our own in order for us to hire people to look at this full time. So if we were serious about impactful work, then we need people to do research, we need people to measure, we need people to assess. Uh, and we've got now three permanent staff actually looking at just giving money away, basically. Okay. So it's something that we obviously feel very strongly about. That's probably going to be where more of our intellectual capital is going to be devoted to over time. For a serving of soul food, have a listen to the podcast edition of Lunch with Masters of Finance. You'll hear more about the good work of Quantage Foundation, as well as opinions and opportunities in ESG by other thought leaders in finance. See you next week for lunch.